I trust that the break has, has refreshed you. You ready for the session? Yes. Good, good. I must confess that the first session was like us cleaning all the cobwebs, uh, doing some house cleaning. And um, you may not know this, but this is the first time I'm preaching outside of the country of South Africa. So I am as rusty as some of you are. So while you were yawning, I was feeling like yawning also. <laughs> well, the, the theme of some of my teachings for the school uh, will be centered around uh, a, a set of teachings I've just done, well, I'm still doing, in a very elementary way in South Africa with my local congregation. Um, many years ago, I was flying back from the Caribbean island, and I heard the Lord say to me that you have no mandate to preach anything anywhere in the world if it has not been first shared with your people in your congregation, and if it has not been tested in the laboratory of your local house. So that set a precedent, a kind of a template for me. And it simply meant that if the message I share does not work in my own congregation, then it is not fit for global consumption. So I make sure that I first share the word in Santon, which is the church that I give leadership to. But obviously, when I come to places like this, then I take it, I upscale it to a new level, because there I speak pastorally and very fatherly to my local congregation. I don't speak from the office of an apostle, even though some call me that. I just speak as a father to my people and see how it is received. But today I want to speak this word into the school. And uh, hopefully it will take a completely different construct. Uh, the second thing that I learned about the nature of my ministry, that's the condition and nature of what I need to do, is that, that God has told me that I need to be a pragmatist very practical in understanding the administrations and implementation of that administration in the church at large. And so he has allowed me to be a senior elder, what you would call a pastor, many would call a pastor, of a local congregation. And to be honest with you, I thought I was being freed from that. Because 10 years ago, um, I was on the verge of handing over the congregation that I led in Peter Maritzburg to a senior son who would then lead that congregation and be free to give myself to itinerant travel to what many would call apostolic ministry. But, um, and I would have liked that because because it was quite encumbering to lead a congregation and still lead a global family of churches. But, but God then said to me very emphatically, I want you to go and raise a family in Santon, Johannesburg, and I want you to lead that congregation from that gate. And so that has helped me to realize that that's going to become the modus operandi of my life in that I have to take the responsibility of being domestic even though I'm also international. But my domestication is more to make sure that if this word does not work in my local church, then my local church cannot be a prototype uh, that can be studied um, by people that I speak to globally. And I have a pretty big global audience, but I have no, no credentials to speak to a global audience 
if it's not verified in the people that I lead at a local level. And I want to say this to all of you leaders here. To reach the world, you must reach your own people. If this work does not work, if this word does not work amongst your people, it won't work anywhere. And you know the principles that I've taught you over previous schools, one of it was the come and see principle. The come and see principle is that when Jesus was asked by the disciples of John, after he came out of the waters of baptism, and they followed him, they asked him the question, well, Jesus, was, uh, well they, Jesus asked them when they were following him, what do you want? And they responded by saying, where do you, say, where do you stay? Where do you live? And Jesus could have, by modern, if, we, if he lived today, he could have given them his website, his YouTube channel address, the link. He could have given them his physical card to say, this is the city I live in, and so forth. Uh, this is where I live. But he didn't do that. What Jesus did was, he, say, he, he retorted, he responded by saying, come and see, come and see. In other words, Jesus was not interested in just telling them where he lived, but he wanted to show them how he lived. This season is a season where you lead by example. It's a season where you cannot preach a message if you are not the message. And, and houses have to be raised in the season to become first fruit congregations where people come to sample you to know what the harvest would be like. This is a prototype element. This is a constituent element of something that still needs to appear. Uh, and these are how we become examples to the flock. Uh, it's great preaching. We've got too many clever preachers. In fact, the church suffers from verbal diarrhea. Everyone spews revelation, but few people can show the show the whole idea, the whole principle of see, touch, handle. Um, very few people can do that. So you can hear a great preacher, you go into his house, and it's in total disorder, total disarray. That's why amongst my family of churches, I'm very strict on making sure that our churches are well-defined and structured. And, uh, and our culture represents heaven, not the earth. Not, not all the challenges we have contextually and situationally or historically. Um, whatever we do must reflect the, the dignity of heaven in our lives. So, so I don't teach anything unless it's first taught to my people. And I'm not saying everyone takes what you say, but at least it must work to a degree there before you can share it with anyone else. So this message was, was already done, and you probably will get the pastoral side of it if you, if you um, go to our platforms. But I want to re release it as an apostolic message. In fact, this message should reset our sight. This message is about sight, about focus, about your end goal. This message is about your life's purpose. Um, this message is an irrational, illogical message from an earthly perspective. But it is rational and logical from a heavenly perspective. In fact, this message is what God expects of each one of us as we reach the eschatos, the end of our journey. We are fast reaching a place a consummate place, a perennial place, uh, a finishing place right now in our journey. You know, you start at a place called Egypt, but you end at a place called Zion. You start at a place called mere mortal, but you end at a place called uh, an eternal immortal, one who now lives timelessly. 
So we are journeying from a child to a consummate place called sonship. These are very, very powerful concepts that can take hours and hours to unpack. So the series, the, the, the set of teachings that I will do with you now is going to focus on a title that I'm going to give it called The Perfect Man, The Perfect Man. And please, the, the, the word perfect is very important here. The perfect man. This must become your goal to, as an individual, become a perfect man. As a community, become a corporate perfect man. And as the church of Jesus Christ, to come to the place of perfection. This must become our goal. The word perfect is within the scope of our journey in Christ. I, I hear the, many people say it's impossible to be perfect. But it depends on how you define the word perfect. Uh, they say no human can be perfect. And I would agree, no human can be perfect. But how the Bible expects us to be perfect and how God defines perfection is something that we have to reconsider and set it as our goal now, as our goal. Uh, Christ is the super, supreme example of perfection. You all know that. Uh, how does a man, how does a man in the person of Jesus Christ become perfect? If you say that only he can become perfect, then salvation is one of the biggest lies ever given to the human race. If only Christ can become perfect, then all of us are going to have a wrong view of Christ in, in Christological and theological circles that will be called a docetic view. The word docetic comes from a doctrine that says that the incarnation was a farce, that Christ did not become flesh. He was not human, that he, he uh, was in no way the very essence of a human being. I'm giving it to you in simple language today. Those, the so docetic said that Jesus appeared to be a man, but it was an appearance. He was not a man in the flesh. He was not human. He did not become corruptible and mortal. And he did not have the ability to be man because he's God, which is true, he is God. Um, so the docetics would argue that he appeared as a similitude of a man, as a ghost-like appearance of a man, but he was not man. And this is most, most Pentecostals believe this. You'll be surprised. We may not believe it objectively, but somewhere in our thought patterns it creeps in that Jesus will always be Jesus and I will never be Jesus. As in being conformed to the fullness of the image of the only begotten son, Romans 8, 29. Um, and that he came to model how all men should live on the earth. So the docetics will say he was like a ghost. He appeared in the similitude of a man. He was, he, he, it was just, it was just what you would call a kind of an avatar, an avatar, one that will just create an appearance but live in this metaverse, in this false world, in this false world. That's not true. Jesus became very man even though he was very God. And in his mortality, he suspended or emptied himself of his divinity. And he became of no reputation. That the word no reputation could also mean that he gave up all his glory. He gave up all of his innate powers. He became very, 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 very man. But he came to show you in his mortality, in his humanity, in the fact that he suspended his divinity, he came to show us that he can still be a perfect man. And he 
as a result of that example, created a template. He created a blueprint. He created an end goal that every one of us should also strive for perfection, for completeness. And in doing that, he reset the original intent of God for the creation of the human race, which was, let us make man in our image and likeness. Can you imagine this? Think about it. Think about it analytically. Think about it judiciously. Think about it like a lawyer. Analyze the words, let us make man in our image and likeness. Is God saying that his image is defected, deficient, marred, scarred? If God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, is it possible that this is a perfect image? Is there any blemish in God? Come and talk to me. Is there any, any scars in God? Is there any impediments in God? Is there any iniquities in God? Is there any weaknesses in God? Absolutely not. So is it possible that when the Creator created us, He had perfection in His mind for us? Come on. Why is it that we fall into this humanistic position, this mortal position, this earthly position that says, it's impossible for me to be perfect, if God created us to be perfect? And He created us to be perfect in this body because He designed it. We are not the, the products of evolution. We are, the, we are the product of the Creator. He made us magnificently, brilliantly, beautifully. I mean, there's no words to describe how powerful uh, the, the crafting of us as humans were in God. So it is within the scope of every one of us to be perfect. Say to your neighbor, you can be perfect. Can be perfect. Ah, and you just looked at your spouse. Huh? Thank God if your wife is not here or your husband is here. Because she's going to point a finger at you tomorrow. Okay, James? Look at Lucy and say to, to Lucy, what are you going to tell her? <laughs> He's too scared. Too scared. But we can be perfect. I'll explain it. Maybe not perfect as in blemishless, sinless, in making mistakes, but you can be perfect. I'll show you that. And it must become the end goal of every pastor, every leader, to raise up people in our congregations with the idea that they can be perfect. You are not called to raise singers and ashes. And what else do you have in church now? Huh? And armor bearers? <laughs> and? Catchers. Oh, you even have catchers here. I thought only, only South Africans that know how to play cricket have catchers. No, you're not called to raise those people. If you're a father of a household, mother of a household, a spiritual parent, male or female, your end goal is to raise up a perfect man in the earth. If you fall short of that, then the Lord will not return for another 10,000 years. He's coming for a perfect man, a complete church, without spot and blemish. These are not phraseologies. These are very powerful statements. Very powerful statements. So the goal is not how to have the largest church in town, the most powerful network, or how to be God's man of power for the hour. The end goal of every one of us is to be perfect. Say to your neighbor, that's the eternal purpose. That's the election and calling. That God will raise a son in his image and likeness. That's election. That's calling. Everything else is domestic. You want to have catches? Yes, so that somebody doesn't have a concussion when they fall. Okay, then you can have a catcher. Because sometimes they will fall when you pray for them. 
But that's not your end goal. That's domestic. Say to your neighbor, domestic. Yes. I'm talking about the eternal. Yes, the eternal. You want to have nice ashes so that you don't have, well, now with isolation and all that, you need ashes to make sure that people behave and they come together in a crowd. Yes, you need ashes. That's not your end goal. That's domestic. That's administrative. It's, that's what Jesus would say, uh, you know, I'm going to have my last meal. So let me send two guys to an upper room, to a house where a man will receive the, the carrier with water on his head and follow that man. He'll get to the house and ask for a room so, and prepare it for me so that when I come with, with my disciples, we can eat. That's administrative. That's domestic. Okay? But... The eternal was, he was going to bequeath himself, <laughs> offload of himself the bread of life when he says, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. So separate the domestic from the timeless, the eternal. Are you hearing me? So this school must now start producing the perfect man. That's a, and I'll show you the phrases that, to refer to this. But Jesus is the supreme Example, supreme example of the perfect man. Obviously, one of the great texts that I love, it's actually, this text is the methodology I use for building my church. Uh, it's Luke 2, 51 to 52. Luke 2, 51 to 52. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. This is after he went, he went AWOL, absent without leave. Uh, for three days. He got so caught up engaging, talking to the prophecies in the temple, the priest, the Levites, and so forth, that he forgot that he was without his parents for three days. I don't know how that happened. It doesn't make sense. But for three days, they couldn't find him. And this boy was, uh, he was bamboozling the people in the temple. But he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. So he submitted. You know, I hear pastors saying, well, I don't need to submit to anybody today. I got the Holy Spirit. Uh, and Jesus was, he was subject, submitted to his mother, uh, to them. That's his father and mother. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased. Jesus increased in wisdom stature, in favor with God, and with man. This is what I fall, call the four quadrants of, of raising up the Son of God in the earth. If you get these four things right, and I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it in church circles. When I say Jesus increased in his mortality, in his humanity, in his, in his existence, Jesus increased in wisdom that will be the intellect. Yes, you can, you can argue spiritual wisdom, but he was also, he just grew in wisdom. And that's your intellectual quotient. Jesus also in, increased in stature. That's your physical development. That's another quadrant. A lot of people today do not take care of their bodies. They don't exercise. They don't eat correctly. They don't develop their well-being. And you know what's the excuse? And COVID exposed this. Oh, I'm under the blood. It's not by might nor by power. By my spirit, saith the Lord. I can do all things through Christ. The no devil can touch me. And then diabetes takes you. A heart, take, a heart problem takes you. And then you live for 30 years and the pastor preaches and says, it is... It is appointed unto man once to die. God designed that this person die at 30. No, God didn't design you to die at 30. All God said, you'll die once. <laughs> he didn't say which age. That age is dependent on you. And you lived 30 years, and it was a tragedy. Not you now, but the person lived 30 years and died. And we say, God knows it was written in heaven. This person will die. No, that's not what God said. God said you'll die once and then he, you will give an account for your life. It is appointed unto man once to die. You're not going to die twice. That's all it means. 
But what happened? But because you didn't take care of yourself, you self-destructed and went to heaven, but you never had days like heaven on the earth. And it was a premature death. Unless, like a Stephen or a Jesus, it's a very unique situation. There again, Stephen chose death to submitting to his persecutors. Okay? And Jesus chose to die so that we all would be saved. That's a different story. But generally, self-destruction. I've seen this at COVID. Pastor said, pastor said, this virus is demonic, it's antichrist. They didn't realize it was a judgment permitted by God from the throne of God. God permitted it. And so they said, we will meet, we will worship, we will have our services, we'll bind the virus, nothing will touch us. And they died. Many of their people died. Whole congregations in some parts of South Africa were wiped out. Randolph will tell you stories. In Durban alone, over 50, 60 pastors, maybe 100 died. Why? They were flirting with understanding the judicious nature of God. Judicious nature. And they didn't understand that if you don't look after your bodies, the virus will take you out. And comorbidities with some of the greatest contributors towards the demise of many people who got infected. And then you can't blame God for that. Can't blame God. So when we talk about growing up into perfection, we are talking about growing up into the sun. And the blueprint, the model is to study Jesus. He increased. Everyone say increased. increased. It, this, this does not mean he was. He had to grow up. It's a proliferation. It's sequential growth. It's developmental growth. So he grew up. And, um, and he had to take care of himself. And he had to grow up physically. So he was physically strong. And in the early days, he was a carpenter. It was hard work, especially if you, you grew up in the home of a poor family even though Joseph was of the line of David, but they were literally poor. How do I know that? Because they gave a pigeon and a dove as, a, as the first fruit offering for their son. Uh, it's the first fruit offering. And only poor people gave that. Rich people gave a lamb. So he would have had to fell trees. He had to prepare the furniture. He had to probably carry it with his dad. He had to do a lot of things, and you know that on many occasions he walked the dusty streets of Galilee, uh, like most of us have to walk uh, to get to a place. But he was physically strong, physically fit. So to, to become perfect, you have to grow in intellect, to stimulate your intellect. You have to know things about the world, even though you cannot, should not be consumed. I read the papers, I read the news. I follow sport. I can sit with somebody and talk about tennis or cricket or rugby or football. Uh, that's not because I'm not saved. Okay, but I know how to adapt to all situations. I know how to talk to people on different levels so I can advise them. And that's intellectual. Some people are so narrow. The most boring people are some church leaders. You can't talk to them. The only thing you can say to them is a few powerful statements about Jesus, and they'll say God is good all the time. <laughs> we need, listen, if you are going to become part of what God is going to do in the earth, that's do with the wealth of nations. That's talk to kings and, uh, and merchants, economists, and politicians. That's be in difficult and very unique situations, you would need to know how to adapt to all of those things. So the, the intellectual quotient is going to be very, very important. Not that you go to mesmerize them with what you know, but you should know enough to get into a conversation. Are you understanding? Because I'm talking about there's a governance coming, but it's not coming to anyone but to a perfect man. That's why Jesus was called the social light, because he could integrate into various communities and talk to various people, and it did not fit the profile of a religious man. So people like the Pharisees, scribes, and the priest of his day rejected him. They called him a socialite. They called him a wine biber. 
They called him a glutton, an overeater. Uh, they called him, uh, well, because he was not of the tribe of Levi, it even, even made things more difficult for him. I want to suggest to you today that if you want to be a perfect man, you have to start to develop physically. You have to start developing intellectually. The next two things is you have to de develop in favor with God, which means your spiritual quotient, your spiritually. And you should know all the things about all the disciplines, prayer, fasting, uh, how to administrate the word of the Lord, how to steward your time. Uh, and all these are spiritual disciplines. And so spiritually, you have to grow. You have to grow. And there's a way with God. You have to know his ways. The word way simply means modus operandi, how he operates. And fourthly, you must grow with men, that's socially. And I already inferred that, referred to that, uh, socially. You should know how to sit at a table and have a meal. You should know how to use a fork and knife. You should know where to put your bones. You should know which fork to use for which course of the meal. And you know what? You don't have to go very far today. Just Google it on YouTube. <laughs> Follow the example. Listen, why am I saying this? Because soon, some of you are going to be raised to the highest levels. I mean, imagine a Joseph from a humble family of shepherds to one of the most powerful men in Pharaoh's administration. Do you know what adaptations have to take place to get to those levels? Do you know why some of us can't get promoted? And why God has to restrain our movement to the top because we are not ready for it. So when I talk about the perfect man here, yeah, just park these four quadrants into the back of your mind. It's going to be very important. Let's talk about it again. Let's talk about it again. And all pastors should learn this, especially in our circles. Because governance, jurisdiction, reach, standing before great people and simple people, all of those things will be part of it. And these four quotients, grow in intellect. Say intellect. Yeah. Grow in physical stature. Grow in your spirit. Grow spiritually. And grow socially. So develop social skills. Understand cross-cultural communication. Stop thinking as a Kenyan or a South African. Start thinking like a son of God. Don't judge everything through the spectacle of your culture. Sit from the vantage point of the heavenly man. See things from a heavenly perspective. Don't become parochial in your worldview. You'll be caught out very, very quickly. We are about to step into something very unique. I didn't realize this until God started to expose me to how people think in political circles, in economic circles, how you have to sit in the presence of a billionaire or in the presence of somebody who could be heading the army of your country or sitting in, in a very, very unique situation. And these people are studying you firstly before they share their hearts with you. And if you pass, you fail the little test, don't expect them to expose themselves to you. They want to see how you engage. And you know that we can all quote the scriptures from Isaiah 60, Isaiah 61, about how sons will come to you from the nations and how you're going to do great things for the Lord. But if you're not ready for it, God can't throw you to the wolves. Are you understanding me? So say to your neighbor, grow up. Okay? And this is a school. Say to your neighbor, this is a school where you should learn. Uh, that's why I admire the way they've taken the step to 
set the school, to the dignity in which they present the meals and so forth. But we have to go to a level where we start training. Right now in our church, this four quadrants, we teach our children how to come sit at the table. We teach them how to eat at the table. We teach them how to develop socially. We teach them how to develop spiritually. We teach them in our Sunday, in our children's ministry, how to develop physically. Because in the Pentecostal circle that I grew up in, I love soccer. I played soccer. I captained our teams, you know, at city and, and state level and almost went professional. But on a Sunday, if I played soccer, I was in big trouble with my church. But I would skip out, slip out by stealth, out surreptitiously, out of the church while they were closing their eyes, jump into the car to go and play soccer. And one day the pastor came to me. And the pastor said to me, I'm going to pray that the next time you play soccer on a Sunday, that God breaks your legs. <laughs> and that was the end of my career. I'm not saying that now we must desecrate the Lord's day, but sometimes some of us are called to represent the Lord in these areas. And when you start to understand that every day is the Lord's day, and that wherever you are, you can worship the Lord, and maybe you are the salt in, in a very corrupt world. I mean, imagine if you were one of the top soccerites. I mean, I see it with, with Salah from Liverpool, one of the great African footballers. Every time he scores a goal, he goes on his knees and he worships his God. He's not ashamed of it. Um, and I'm sure that he will never betray his principles. But in our, in our circles today, no, we'd rather take all our kids away from that world instead of putting them there and telling our kids, come on, stand up tall and shine for Jesus. Shine for the kingdom. But we have to produce these. We've not produced it. What we've produced is a happy, you know, clappy, very entertainment-centered church. We're not producing the caliber of people that we want. So Jesus was the supreme example of perfection. Uh, Colossians 1, 19 to 23. Colossians 1, 19 to 23. So it, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. All the fullness of God should dwell. The pleroma. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. Mark the words here. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the, cross, the blood of his cross. And you, and you, everyone say you. you. Say me. me. And, and you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind. Everyone say in the mind. In the mind. That's where our biggest problem is, in the mind. By wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh. Everyone say in the body of his flesh. Yeah. Let me give you the proper language here in contemporary uh, statements. The body of his flesh is his humanity. Press your flesh. That's it. In your body. In the body, in his physical body, through death, to present you. Everyone say us. Holy. Everyone say Holy. And blameless. This, is, this word means blemishless, perfect, complete, and above a reproach in his sight. And if indeed you continue in the faith, in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, this portions of scriptures like this are blueprints, very powerful portions of scripture that we need to earth. We need to bring it down and peg it into our context. And this portion of scripture is very simply telling us that all the fullness can live in a body. All the fullness of God can live in a body. Please get that into your minds. Uh, all the fullness of God can live in you and me, 
because he did it for us. He did it for us. He didn't come. I mean, I would think it's foolish for God to come in the flesh to show you how he can heal a blind eye. Does God have an inferiority problem? Is God insecure? Does God have to prove to you that he can raise the dead so that you can believe he's God? I mean, why would he have to do those things? Does God have to prove to you that he can walk on water when he created the oceans? So why would he do all these things? Only to tell you what you can do. Only to tell you what your capacity is if you know how to live in compliance to his design. He sets the example only to show us how to become disciples of it. Okay, that's all. That's all it is. God, that's why Jesus would say after he healed somebody, go and tell no one. Why? Because that was not his life's purpose for, for people to talk about the miracles. The life's purpose was that through those miracles, you could know how you are supposed to be modeled or formed or squeezed into shape. That's all. That's all. Please, this is very, very important. So it has to come within our capacity that we can reach this position of completeness. It is within us. So perfection can come into our human behavior. So our human behavior must take on the form of perfection. So, so please, I'm going to landscape this now in this session and then go into the deeper detail of it in, in the following sessions. Um, so, so say to your neighbor, perfection is within our scope. But to be perfect, you have to perfect your behavior. Okay? To be perfect, you have to work on your behavior. This is very practical stuff. A lot of people are not working on their behavior. Not on their behavior. They're working on how they can put on a good sermon on a Sunday. I mean, I'm trying to perfect little things like, I mean, silly things. Silly things. Like how to pick up my socks. So that my wife doesn't have to do that. I'm learning how to be conscious of how to sit at the table. I'm learning how to find ways of perfecting my behavior by caring for others more than myself. I'm becoming so conscious of this that I want to make sure that in every aspect of my life, my behavior is not flawed with weaknesses. And this is, this, let me tell you something. If God's going to give us what he wants to give us, we have to be faithful with little things. If you can't manage your time, if you can't manage your relationship, if you can't manage the promises you make, I mean, I won't sleep if I tell somebody I'm going to do a certain thing and I've not done it. Literally, I won't sleep. In other, by that I mean it will worry me through the night until I do it. Are you hearing me? I mean, these are highly principled dimensions of living. And what I'm beginning to realize is that, unfortunately, unfortunately, most of us cannot, most of us cannot produce the perfect man in us. So you, God has to use life to squeeze us into shape. God uses life. Life's encounters, life's experiences, um, because part of being perfect is to bring the soul into shape in the valley of great testings. Our souls are shaped by life's experiences. At the beginning of the COVID, we as a family, that's my wife and I, and our immediate family was severely tested through the birth of our firstborn son, who, well, grandson, firstborn grandson, who was 84 days in ICU. 
and was on over 10 machines to keep him alive. And we found through that experience how many areas of our life was not congruent with the word that we preach to the nations. And we had to learn a few things through that experience because we didn't know whether this child would live or die. He went through five operations. And he was our first. And we were consumed by the thought that our own children had to go through something that we felt they did not deserve. But through it, my soul learned a few lessons. One is that no man of God is exempt from suffering. And that suffering is part of the module that brings us into perfection. And in the university of the spirit, God uses suffering to squeeze the soul into shape. I had to also learn that this was not a time to feel sorry for myself and look for pity from the nations. But my mandate was to continue learning through this very dark and difficult time, knowing that even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord will prepare a table for me. So I didn't go, and none, none, no, no one son of mine can tell me, and Randolph is one of my close guys all these years, quite close. No one son will say, will, 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 can point a finger at me and say that I was looking for pity from anybody. I wouldn't talk about it in my sermons. I'm actually giving more airtime to it today and last night. Yeah. And it was not I was, that I was living in denial. What I realized was that no man of God is exempt from trials, and if trials do come, it is the fiery furnace that God uses to squeeze my soul into subjection to his perfect will. The other thing I learned was that through this, God intended to bring me closer to him so that I would be one with him, even though the situation tried to pull me away from him. I had to learn in my behavior that every sermon I preach to others must first work in me. Having preached to others, I did not want to become a castaway. So I had to buffet my body, punch my body, beat it into subjection to his womb. That's now talking about behavior management. I had to learn in the midst of this to identify with others that went through similar problems and yet I never felt their pain until I went through the pain. And I realized that we were not an exempt uh, uh, family with a unique experience. But many thousands of others go through a similar experience. So why should I feel sorry for myself when others also are going through a similar situation? And I learned that to be perfect, you have to learn obedience through the things you suffer. Even God permitted his son to learn not through revelation only, but through suffering. Let me tell you, when you learn how to let these things happen, you start to feel something forming within you that makes you grow up. Are you hearing me? Now, you can write down all your experiences that are negative. But the question is, how did you deal with it when you went through it? It's easy to say that I live for Christ. I surrender my all to him. But, but those experiences have to be tested. Tested. So there are two areas specifically that God will deal with to squeeze you into perfection. One is your soul. The other is your spirit. In, in Philippians 3, 12 to 16, it says, not that I have already attained, 
Philippians 3, 12 to 16. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected. And this is the great apostle telling us that he's not yet reached the goal, but it is his goal. But I press on. Everyone say press on. Now you're going to make mistakes, but you have to press on. That I may hold, lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus had laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, ahead I press forward, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What's that prize? Not money, not heaven. It is reaching perfection. That's the prize. I'll explain this to you when I teach again. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. Everyone say mature. Are you mature? Ask your neighbor if you're mature. Are you mature? There's so much of immaturity in the church, you'll be shocked. You know, 90% of my ministry is done with pastors, leaders. I'm stunned. They get offended so e easily. They are so sensitive. They deal with rejection badly. They are like little kids sometimes in diapers. But if we are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same room. Let us be of the same mind. Very beautiful scripture. I, I can exegete it, but I'm not going to do that. All I want to say is that no matter what you do, let it be a goal for you that I'm going to work towards the state of perfection. I've not reached it yet, but I'm going to work towards it. Can you make that a goal? Okay, and then I'm talking to you now on a personal level, but if you're a leader, you have to make it the goal of your congregation to be mature. Hebrews 12, 23 tells us, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. To the spirits of just men, just men. These are judicious, equitous, well-balanced thinkers made perfect. And whether they're in heaven or not is another question. But the point I'm making is, yeah, that Philippians 3 is telling us about how to set it as your goal to bring yourselves, that's your soulish a dimension in life, bring it to a place where you reach perfection. And Hebrews tells us that even your spirits can be made perfect. And we have to start working on these minute aspects within our construct. They're not minute as in small, but the area of soul and the area of spirit has to be dealt with. And I'll, I'll talk about those things a little later on. Now, there are many, many examples in the scripture of perfect people. So let me give you a few. Noah is a wonderful example of a perfect man. I want you to see that perfection was within the scope of people. And, and you know, perfection in Noah's case, let me read it first. Genesis 6 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah. Noah was a just man. Everyone say just man. The word just could also mean righteous a man that was compliant to heavenly designs. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. The word here means complete, mature, in his generation. Noah walked with God. So if Noah was a perfect man, can we be perfect? Can we? Are you understanding? And listen, he made some huge blunders, huge blunders. One of the great blunders that he made was that he got consumed with the thing that he was harvesting. So his trade became his downfall. He became consumed with the wine that he drank from his own vineyards. 
I think one of the other huge blunders he made was he refused to bless uh, his son Ham for exposing his nakedness, his weaknesses, and, and also put a kind of a curse on, Can uh, on Canaan, the son of Ham. And there's all sorts of theories about that. So while he was a man with many, that made many blunders, it seemed like he learned a dimension of maturity and completeness that is very unique. I'll talk about that. That's rather confusing right now, that a man that is supposed to be perfect is still very human, very human. Abraham also lived a perfect life. Genesis 17.1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. The word for blameless is the same word for perfect. So here's a man, and he lived in an in a idolatrous context, Abram. And you know, he would do things like lie. He lied. He lied to the Egyptian leader, Pharaoh. He, he also lied to uh, the Philistine leader. Uh, Abimelech, he lied about his wife. He, he, yes, he was married to, to his, his, his uh, close relative, probably his father's uh, brother's wife, uh, daughter, or something like that. Well, there's so many schools of thought on the subject. But he protected his life so much that his weakness was that he self-preserved before he thought about hair safety. So he, he was prepared for her to be sexually abused by these kings as long as they did not kill him for her. That's tough. Huh? That's tough. So he had some weaknesses, yet the Lord said to him, walk blamelessly before me, walk perfectly before me. So God, in his foreknowledge, knew these things, yet at the same time, God said to him, you can be blameless. I'll explain these things a little later on because the covenant of the blood is a very powerful covenant that brings us into a position where if we choose to stay under the covenant or under the life of Christ, his rulership over us, we could enjoy completeness. Now this word blameless in the Hebrew is the word tamin, tamin. And this word has got to do with the entirety of one's life. Like I told you that Jesus grew intellectually, physically, uh, spiritually, and socially. This word has got to do with various aspects, various elements of development in your lives. One is to grow up in, in, in a figurative way, to grow up morally, to develop a morality. And your moral dimension has got to do with your soul. This is to have morals. Uh, by that I mean to develop a culture of sincerity. Yeah. Sincerity. Please, please hear me. I, I know you, this is a tough session. But hear me very, very carefully. These are very important aspects because, you know, we, we've been glossing over our spiritual development. We've not been digging into into the dirt to see where we are weak. And sometimes we have a lack of sincerity. By that I mean transparency, um, integrity, um, a kind of uprightness. So when we talk about morality, we must talk about understanding how we need to develop a lifestyle uh, where there is moral goodness in us. Yeah. And I mean it in very simple things like how you treat people when they leave your church. Do you have a morality? Or you behave no less or no better than them? I mean, if somebody comes to you and says, for example, God told me that my time, my season with you is over. What's the behavior that comes out of you as a leader of the Church of Jesus Christ, as a steward? 
anger, discomfort, you pull your face, pull rank. That's a lack of morals. Of course, you can ask them questions like, did God really tell you? No. Uh, are you sure about your decision? I don't agree with your decision. But if you choose that this is the way you have to go, then I have no recourse but to release you, even though I may not be able to bless you, because I'm not convinced that you're doing it for the right reason, but I will not put a curse on you. Are you understanding? And then you have to learn how to release them and have uprightness, morality. Let me give you a good example. Here's a blameless way. You have your own nephew, your own nephew, your father's son's child. Because your brother dies at an early age, prematurely, and because your father took responsibility of this boy, and then he, your father died, it now becomes incumbent upon you to adopt him as your own son. And that's how you take care of your lot. And then there comes a time where lot now has developed into a man and he's developing his own business profile. And he's walking in the shadow of grace, not knowing that he's only blessed because of Abraham. And I will talk about that when I talk about the perfect man how to create environments for perfection to take place. And sometimes you have to learn how to stay in the shadow of a grace carrier that can make you successful. And then this person is prospering because of success. Success. And he thinks it's because of his herdsman and what he is building. And obviously he puts the spirit of strife in these men. And they start to fight over water in the land that the herds are grazing. And Abraham has to now show a blameless or mature position because one of the words of perfection is maturity. And the mature position is we are brothers. Not I, you are my son, I adopted you. I cared for you. It was my grace that made you successful. That's an immoral man. When you ever say, my grace made you successful, you are as immoral as the one saying, God told me to leave. You're a very sick soul. But what is morality in this context? Let us not create strife. Because Abraham understood something. Strife is a blockage that robs the flow of grace. Any form of strife hinders the flow of grace. That's how you get spiritual aneurysms and strokes in the church. So what does Abraham do to show his integrity, sincerity? He says to him, he says to him, choose the best land. Take everything you want. And whatever you leave behind, I'll take it. That's moral uprightness. That's sincerity. That's not how you're going to start to crawl towards maturity. I mean, recently I had a young couple. They're not pastors, but I mentored them into a position where they are enjoying great success and blessed them, helped them through a very dysfunctional marriage and so forth. And they came to me the other day and they said to me, we feel that we can grow further by joining another apostle who is a very close friend to me, extremely close. And uh, we think that it's best for you to release us. And will you release us so we can go to this apostle and grow with him because we, we feel a lot of his teachings. Obviously, in the natural, you feel like your ego just got punctured. <laughs> and you try to remember all the things you did for them. And you want to bring all of that now as the case to tell them that what you shouldn't be leaving. But this message on perfection came at the right time for me. 
because I, I couldn't do it because I was going to be politically correct, and you can be politically correct. But perfection for me was, how can I be morally good? If they are going to grow there, and I can't give them the, the grazing ground to grow there, then I must bless them, release them. As long as they're in the company of my friend, because I know you'll take better care of them than I do. And I release them. And I bless them. I didn't talk about all the money I invested in them or how they grew in stature in their career. And if they think that's a better place to be, then so be it. But you know, for me, the litmus test with Abram was not so much that he released his lot. The litmus test was when he learned that judgment was coming on the area that Lot lived in. And the litmus test was very simply, how will the man now react? He could now say that, see, you got out of covering. See, your shield is gone. See, you broke covenant. You deserve it. Now I can have my Pentecostal praise service. But Abraham interceded until he wore down the angels and secured the release of Lot and his wife, and, and his daughters and the wife. And his intercessions and the release of Lot would cause Israel major problems later on because of those two incestuous children that would be produced by the daughters of Lot, Moab. And what's the other name? Ammon, the Ammonites. And they, up till today, are thorn in the flesh to Israel. But Abraham would rather secure the release of his son, even though he called him my brother, and have all the problems that come with it because of integrity. Let me tell you something. You will be tested. I don't think those, that couple just left me. I think God used them to test me. They will be blessed where they are. In this season, the heart is being tested. And the heart has got to do with sincerity, integrity, morality, uh, uprightness, completeness, maturity, justice, and a whole host of things. That's morality for me. That's the kind of people. We want well-rounded people in the season. These are people with finesse, with refinement, with purity, with innocence, with a sense of, if you take anything from me, you took nothing because I own nothing. If you think you've just dashed my reputation, I have no reputation. If you think you've abandoned me, you've not left me. Because I am like Abel, I am nothing. That's morality. Now you want to be blameless? That's the way you become blameless. Daniel and his friends were another classical example of perfection. Daniel 1. Uh, you can read all the verses. Verse 4 says, and this is what the, you know. Let me read from verse 3. Then the king instructed Hashpenaz, uh, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men, in whom there was no blemish. Young people, you hear me? You hear me? But good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. 
verse 15. And at the end of 10 days, their feature appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams, and so forth. Uh, and 20, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding above which the king examined them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Here's a few points I want to make here. And, and just hear my heart here. I told you at the outset, at the introduction of the school, that, that the statements I would make would be very simple. Very simple. But they will pierce your hearts. Because they've been surrounded and polished and, and developed by what the Lord wants to do in the season. One of the things that God's going to do in the season is equalize our understanding of how anointing flows in the body of Christ. By that I mean he is destroying the wall of partition between laity and clergy. In fact, words like laity and clergy are demonic words. They should be used in secular language, not in church circles. They can, because they have a way of separate. When I say demonic, I simply mean they'll separate you from God. That's what devils do. They seek to separate you from God. That's what demonic is. What do I mean by that? Because most of us think that only pastors or fivefold ministers can be perfect, we don't realize that God is now bringing perfection upon the whole body. And we all are members of the same body. Whether you are in fivefold ministry or not, every one of us are called. The anointing on Daniel was that he was part of a group of captives that would go to Babylon um, and he would be part of the prophecy of Jeremiah that in Babylon God will cause his children to prosper. And that his thoughts towards them are thoughts of peace and prosperity for them. So they were not going to prosper in Israel. They were going to prosper in Babylon. But when they went to Babylon, the Daniel anointing, and Dan, the name Dan for Daniel, means a judge, judicious, equitous. It means the spirit of righteousness, which is that you know how to interpret life, how to manage life's challenges. And he was a young man. He was not a priest. He was not, he was not called. To that, to that life. He came from the tribe of Judah, I think. But he had to learn that God wanted to use him in a blameless way. Daniel had a lot of faults and failures like every human being. But when it came to the things of God, he had set his heart on pilgrimage. He set his heart. So yes, Daniel, being selected with a whole group of young people from Judah to be used in the Babylonian Empire and Daniel to be used in, in this empire had to follow certain conditions and some of it was appearance how you presented your disposition your beauty and beauty is in the eye of the beholder there's, n there's no set script for beauty every one of us are beautiful but not all of us think that everyone here is beautiful. Why? Because you're prejudiced. That's all. Everyone here is absolutely beautiful. Or maybe I should say handsome also. But not all of us will be attracted to everyone that we see. But these boys were selected because of their appearance. Uh, put those, that verse back. There was no blemish. That means these were young people that knew how to, how to decorate themselves, how to present themselves, 
please hear me, because there's an equalization taking place. One of the greatest moves of God now is taking place out there in, in corporate society. I'm seeing promotions during the COVID-19. God told me, stay indoors, stay in lockdown, don't have a church service. I mean, we had a, a broadcast, but not in-house physical gatherings. He said, you will see increase. You'll see land acquisitions. You'll see promotions. You will see your people getting job increases, salary increases. You will buy properties. I mean, I bought two properties during COVID without traveling anywhere, without getting honorariums. You will see some phenomenal things happen, and there will be no unemployment amongst you. And there was a recession in our land. Uh, South Africa was downgraded to junk status economically speaking. Uh, our economy is in the worst state it could be in. And suddenly, my people were just prospering. Just prospering. Our church's income almost doubled during COVID without taking a single offering. Almost doubled. I think we broke all records. And the Lord said to me, all this is a sign that if my people build their lives right, without those so-called church services, I'm not against coming together, I love that. My people, God said, will be blessed. But how you build? And suddenly favor came, favor came. There would be retrenchments taking place in huge companies, and then they will say to to the people that are in our church, to the young people, but because we see something extraordinary on you, we're not going to retrench you. My young son, my youngest son, is a mechanical engineer, and he was just, just before COVID, he got a job with a company where he would have to serve, serve his two-year internship uh, to be a junior, to qualify as a junior engineer. And during those two years, this international company had to retrench 190 people towards the end of the two years. And they had a policy, last in, first out. If you came in last, you go out first. And it's a policy. You can't violate those policies. And 190 people, including many, many senior engineers and so forth, were retrenched. They called him and they said to him, we've decided that we are not going to retrench you. He was shocked because he was quite distraught at the idea that the prophecy was not going to work on his life. You know, because I said to our church, there will be no retrenchments. And they said, we're not retrenching you. We see you as talent for the future. And so we're going to secure your position. Uh, and you're going to be the exception to the rule. And then I realized if we produce the, the caliber of people the world is looking for, it was Daniel caliber. But you have to start working towards blamelessness. And it's not just blamelessness as in being free of all human deficits, but moral uprightness, common sense, clean living, learning not to bow your knee to every time they raise the glass to shout cheers to the wine. Learning how to manage yourself in environments like, like Daniel did. Choosing to follow the diet of the kingdom of heaven. And that doesn't mean that Daniel may not have drank a glass of wine. He probably did. Most of the people in Judah did. It just simply meant that he will not drink the king's wine. He will not go that way. And I want to say to us here today, this is the kind of blamelessness that we need to see come into the church. But today we see our young people that are eunuchs to the world, castigated. The moment they go into employment, they are take their, their ability to be fruitful is taken away. Then they are managed by the system of the world. and They no, never produce for the kingdom they only produce for their masters. They become slaves to the system. 
they are unfruitful to the world order, to the divine order of God. So today, as we close the session, and I'm, I'm actually still crawling into the session. I'm just trying to landscape our thinking. The perfection is within our scope. Christ set the example. Humans set the example. And perfection is for every one of us. For every one of us. When I do my next session tomorrow with you, I'm going to define blamelessness. I'm going to define perfection. I'm going to show you how we can operate in this dimension. And I'm asking every pastor here to develop strategies, whether you use the four quadrants, uh, the physical, intellectual, spiritual, social quadrants, but develop it so you can raise the youth, you can raise the young people, the, the children, you can raise the husband, the wife, the adults, you can raise up pastors. I use the, co the cautions. I even employ people to be in my full-time hospitality ministry to set the example of how people in the kingdom of God should socialize. I mean, I pay for cooks full-time just to do those things. I have a pastor in my church that gives pastoral oversight, but one of the auxiliary functions is hospitality. Because if you don't develop this culture, we're not going to produce the kind of people we want in the world. Are you hearing me? So, so hear, hear these thoughts, muse upon them, but you have to develop strategies out of them. And hopefully by the end of the school, we can see these things happen. Well, God bless you.